I discovered John Rimborn whilst I was at college. Uh, I grew up in a, a musical family. My mum plays the accordion, and my dad used to play the clawhammer banjo, made the family PA system. We had a family band. There were five of us. It was called the Gene Carroll Trio. <laughs> um, but I uh, took a break from Trinity College for, you know, one weekend, probably get my washing done or something, and I noticed that John Rimborn was playing at my local folk club, the Red Lion in Manning Tree, the gigs upstairs. So I asked if I could play the support, the organisers said I could, and so I worked up a, some pieces that I had written along with some jazz pieces. I thought John Rimborn was downstairs changing his strings or messing with his nails or something, getting ready for his concert. But it turns out that he was at the back of the room and he watched my set in its entirety. And at the end, he came up to me and asked if I'd recorded anything. And up till that point, I hadn't. Uh, but a few months later, I supported um, that Irish harp guitar duo, uh, Moira and Hassig and Chris Newman. And they offered me my first record. And I told Renborn about it. And he very kindly wrote the sleeve notes to my first record. Um, this guitar is made by uh, a really uh, incredible character called Ralph Bowne. He's based in York. Uh, my own guitar here is made by the same guy. In actual, he has quite a long waiting list most of the time. And I was playing with John Rembo and I received a letter one time saying it'd be great to see two Bounds on the stage. How about it? <laughs> <laughs> I thought about that for about half a second. Um, but this is the guitar that John used when... We toured together, and also on that first concert in Manningtree, or the start of the concert anyway. Uh, unfortunately, he, he trod on the pickup system of that first concert, and the whole thing hit the floor, and unfortunately still further, the headstock snapped off. And I think that happened a few times. You know, this guitar doesn't like flying too much, uh, but I'm looking after it now, and, and uh, I don't take it out on the road. I just use it at home for recording and things. It's an OM style guitar, Brazilian rosewood. It's been through the wars, as you can probably see. It's got a lot of cracks and things on it. I mean, you know, wide grain Brazilian rosewood. You only have to look at it in cold, dry conditions and it, and it cracks. Um, but it's had, well, you know, built in 1985. How many years is that now? Yeah, uh, 95, 20, 34 years of play. Yeah. So it's really played in. The bottom end's it's got that kind of pre-war Martin grand piano kind of vibe to it. Um, the neck's quite thin. That's the way he liked it. Um, he had his had a kind of custom set of strings, and the, the string with the most tension, I think, on acoustic guitar is probably the third string. So he had a slightly lower ten, uh, third string, instead of like a regular 24. He might have used a 21, 22 or something. Um, and he's got uh, still he's got his pickup system on. It's the uh, Mimesis pickup system, a kind of Mike Vanden system, precursor to Fishman. Kind of uh, is, it, is it rare earth, something like that. Uh, but it's without the microphone, so uh, I had the pleasure of sitting next to him during his sound checks, <laughs> which would consist of him plugging this thing into a LR bags preamp, and then he'd instruct the sound man to. Um, pull up a SM57 instrument mic and the basic instruction was to make it sound as cheap and nasty as possible <laughs> in other words take all the bottom end out so you're left with a little bit of mid range but for the most part you've got that kind of you can hear the finger work mm. on, the, on the strings yeah. which the pickup doesn't bring out yeah, so the pickup has a kind of jazzy sound and that kind of picks up the strength of the instrument and then you get all the delicate kind of detail through the microphone sound. Mm. And that's what I do actually on my own bound guitar. It's a similar kind of setup, but I've got the, um, you know, this jazz sound here so I can move about and the microphones in the guitar. I run a stereo lead out of that thing. So on the pickup signal, I have bass, up, you know, a lot of bass sounds, a tiny bit of mid range and the treble's completely off. It gives that kind of jazzy vibe. Mm. And then on the pickup system inside that guitar, I turn all the bass off and a little bit of mid-range and a little bit of treble. 
Yeah. yeah. And it kind of makes it sound natural, but at a loud volume. And because you're turning the bass off the microphone, you get rid of the feedback. Yeah. He was intrigued by Arthurian legends and medieval tales as a kid. Um, he had, has a half-sister called Rebecca. And I met Rebecca at John's funeral, and she was telling us that um, when she was a kid, as an older brother, he would tell her stories, and he would be Sir John a lot <laughs> in those stories. Yeah. And he discovered um, uh, the 14th century composer and priest, um, uh, Guillaume de Machaut, when he was about 14 at school. So the interest was there, and um, then he applied it to, to six strings. So, yeah, I can try and pick one for you if you like. Yes. All right. <laughs> So yeah, that was the, the the Earl of Salisbury by William Byrd, and um, one of the most you know the one of the classic albums, along with the Lady and the Unicorn, is uh, Sir John a lot, and I think that's the opening track. So at this point, John's well on his way to defining his sound yeah. mm -hmm. for guitar and glockenspiel on the record. Oh. Yeah, <laughs> rock on. Yeah. <laughs> So as far as alternate tunings go, um, yeah, he did move well away from standard tuning. Uh, the first one you head towards is drop D, I guess. Which is kind of standard these days, I suppose. Um, for example, uh, Lady Nothing's Toy Puff. It's in, <laughs> in drop D. An interesting title, I guess. Yeah. 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 Um, you know, a slightly smaller piece might have been known as a lady or nothings or, you know, just a short little toy or a puff. So John decided to join all of those words together to create his own title. <laughs> so Lady Nothings Toy Puff. Um, <laughs> Played. I used to play Bert Jansch's part, which was a, uh, which is lovely in its own right. right? Um, the ending was really good. John was, when he was arranging, he liked to stick in a harmonic, <laughs> sometimes where possible, I think, you know, to make it really work on the guitar. The ending of Lady Nothing's, well, Bert's part was really fun, says. So Isn't that cool? Yeah, I mean, you could go. But the R. Yeah, always a nice moment in the, in the concerts. So, yeah, uh, that's drop D. Uh, open G tunings. Um, he had a medley uh, that included the English dance, which is on the Black Balloon album, I think, from 1979. Uh, let me get into open G tuning for you. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, I'm already in drop D, so 
We're going to lower the A string down to G. Um, then the high string E down to D. That's it. So we've got G and D. Banjo tuning. <laughs> Maybe if I stick the cap on. G major tuning. Yeah. All right. If you move the second string down to B flat, they're in G minor tuning. I can pick one in this tuning for you. Um, so yeah, as well as open G and the G minor tuning, uh, John occasionally used dadgad, not too often as far as I can remember, but he might have played a piece like Archie Fisher's Lindsay, for example, or an Irish tune. Um, <laughs> Uh, that's called Elizabeth Kelly's Delight. So there's Angie, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, I think around about in around about 1960, John heard Davy Graham for the first time, and I think he pretty much blew everyone away, mm -hmm. by all accounts. Um, I think he kind of blew himself away as well, unfortunately. But uh, I wasn't there at the time, but I, it kind of paved the way for. Certainly, you know, solo fingerstyle guitar playing, from my perspective, if it wasn't for people like Davy Graham and John Renborn and Bert Yanchel and so on, I'd probably have nowhere to play. <laughs> you know? So they paved the way for the certainly the British solo acoustic guitar scene. And the most significant piece from that time, as far as I know, was a, a, by Davy Graham, and it's the piece Angie, right? So the idea is that you have... Um, <laughs> Descending bass line as well. And you stick to the, the two together. All right. Um, and I'm sure John must have been influenced by that when he wrote the piece Judy. <laughs> Instead of. Heading down to the F there, he says head down to F sharp. <laughs> it's in three, but you can hear the similarity. In actual fact, he used to pair them up. Maybe he started with Angie and, or Judy and then went into Angie or something in his sets, in his solo sets. Yeah, I used ping-pong balls, as did John Renborn. I didn't pick up the idea from him, though. I picked them up from my third-year guitar teacher at college. And she's called Nicola Hall, amazing classical guitarist, great teacher. Uh, she used to use different coloured ping-pong balls, but I've stuck with white. <laughs> um, as did John, and he had slightly longer nails than the length I prefer. Steiger's a good make. Will we get in trouble? No. <laughs> you can get two star or you, and you can get three star. Um, the difference is, is that the three stars sound more rich and warm and fibrous and organic. 
twos don't quite last as long. But you can't use cheap balls because when you apply the super glue, they t- glue they turn green. <laughs> <laughs> well, guitar players have been trying all sorts of stuff for years, right? You know, everything from toilet roll to onken yogurt pots, <laughs> or going to the beauty salon, you know, and getting you know fake nails done there. I find those too thick myself. The tone's too thick. I did try it as a teenager. Um, but after discovering the ping pong ball trick, I've been using the same idea for 20 years or more, I guess. You know, it's got some pretty dodgy ingredients in the glue, but there's nothing wrong with me. You know, so it's just a twitch. And what you do is you um, use it. You know, those cuticle scissors, mm-hmm. kind of, you've got a little curve at the end. They're really helpful for cutting a piece out of the ping pong ball. Uh, so you've got a little piece, and then you cut a semicircle. And I know, it's pretty sad really, but I know the curvature of each, at the end of each tip, you know, they're not all the same. And uh, you make sure it fits pretty well, file off the edges a smidge so they don't stick into your skin, and then apply a layer of super glue. Can't be cheap stuff, Loctite is good, (laughs) crazy glue in America. Uh, I think some people use like Araldite or boat glue or something. But I always, I always use the kind of runny Loctite stuff myself. And you place a little slither on the ball, stick it to the underneath of your nail, not on top of your nail. And I like sticking it underneath, as did John and Nicola Hall, because you're playing with the glue, as opposed to all the other nails, you know, you're sticking it on top of your nail. Not only does it ruin your nail, it take, you know, your nails end up being very thin and weak, um, but it might ping off. I guess, you know. But if you're playing with the glue, it's probably not going to happen. Though there is a classic story of when it happened to Rembrandt one time, and he ended up sticking his lips together. <laughs> um, but uh, once it's stuck, there's quite a lot sticking out, protruding from the original shape of, of your own nail. And, you know, just small clippers, just kind of clip it into shape roughly, and then use, I've got one here, use a large nail file like that. Pretty rough on one side, you know, work out the shape, thin it down there, and then you end up with some filing it with 2000 grade sandpaper. I got this from the local car body shop repair center in the next village. I went in there and I said, You know, all right, mate. He's like, All right, what do you want? I said, Well, have you got any 2000 grade? He says, Of course I have, you know, he's finishing his paintwork on the, on the cars. I said, Have you got any sheets that I could have? He said, I said, Well, What's it for? I said, it's for my nails. He gave me 20 sheets and told me to get out of there, but I've been using the same stuff since. <laughs> so it really helps to file it with the 2000 grade because that strengthens the tone. Right. You know. Um, you know, different ways of filing. Some people like to file that way a lot. You know, so, you know, a lot of classical guitarists like that angle for a really even thicker tone, but I, f- I figure you know, the same shape as the end of the tip of your fingertip itself it, you know the skin is a is, is a good enough tone for me mm. it's pretty it's pretty fat you know his hands were quite square on so they weren't like an electric guitar you know like stevie ray you're like you know you're, you're glued you know this part of your fingers glued there he plays almost like a classical player i guess um it's interesting to point out that he didn't always well, he certainly didn't play like i'm playing now for the most part, he crossed this right leg over his left, mm. as a lot of people who are watching this will know, seen him in concert, you know, and towards the end, he'd grab his right foot on stage, you know, he'd pull it out, just weld himself into shape and in, into place, and off he'd go, you know. Um, but also, he used the classical guitar cushion. You've seen that thing? Right, yeah. um, And on this guitar, you can see that he had a little piece there, he had a little bracket as well, sometimes he used as well. Um, but in terms of left hand technique, it was kind of kind of like like this, you know. His his fingers weren't too thin, and had a very light touch. Actions not too high. Strings are pretty light. In actual fact, I think you know the older he got, the heavier the string became. I think he might have been down to nines or tens in the sixties, at a guess, I think, and. He was using, you know, 12, 12 to 53. I think at some point earlier on, he might have been down to a, like a 42 or a 46 or something on the bass. It's a super light for an acoustic guitar. Mm. Um, but, you know, it's a very, very straight, kind of to, to the fret wire. 